This program was made possible by funding from the University of Central Florida's Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies. For instance, um, you have dense development up against the up against the conservation lane. You have light pollution. You have noise pollution. You have uh, uh, a vector for exotic species to enter the conservation land, both animal and plant. It's expensive because we ended up having to defend our um, amendment through lawsuits. And as citizens, it's much harder to raise money than. Uh, business interests and commercial interests and development interests. Hello, I'm Linda Chapin with the University of Central Florida. Let me welcome you to Naturally Central Florida, a series of seven programs about the unique and beautiful places in our Florida landscape. This is an effort involving business people and environmentalists and citizens like you and me. Our part of the state is at a crossroads today because of the enormous growth we're experiencing and the pressures of development. We want to identify the most critical, must-save places in Central Florida and figure out a way to protect them from being turned into subdivisions and strip malls. Today, we're going to take you to the vast wetlands of the Green Swamp, which spreads across portions of five counties. Naturally, Central Florida's Alicia Callanan Mandigo introduces us to someone who can tell us why this multifaceted landscape is so important. One can only imagine what it was like for the pioneer homesteaders who carved out this tiny farm in the middle of the green swamp nearly a hundred years ago. The area is remote even today. When these folks lived here, they were quite literally in the middle of nowhere. Well, we're in, in the Green Swamp Wilderness Preserve. It's a, a little over 100,000 acre conservation area owned and managed by the Southwest Florida Water Management District. We're right on the Polk uh, Lake County line right now, standing on the banks of the Withlacoochee River, pretty close to within a few miles of its, of its source. Tell me a little about the lay of the land here. You have one hunk here that is preserved and it backs up to a state forest. So you have a, continu a contiguous preserve, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what happens here in terms of the environment. Well, um, as you said, the, uh, between the Water Management District and the, the state of Florida, We've protected over 150,000 ac contiguous acres here in the Green Swamp. Uh, the Green Swamp Wilderness Preserve, the Water Management District part, and the Withlacoochee State Forest, which adjoins uh, district property on the north is the state's part. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at a road map of central Florida, there's a big open hole where there are no roads, a big hole, it's obvious on, on, on any map. That's the Green Swamp. Its, its largeness, um, its bigness, makes it very significant habitat. Um, also, the diversity of habitats here make, make it significant. Um, different species of wildlife use different types of habitat. When you have a mosaic or, and a good diversity of habitat, uh, you have a lot of species and a lot of animals. It's very pr productive. Um, and then the, the the fact that it's been under public ownership, the Green Swamp Wilderness Preserve and the State Forest, the fact that it's been under public ownership for, well, since the 60s, and the State Forest even previous to that, it's been managed for habitat values, prescribed burning, exotic control has been, has been practiced, uh, protecting those attributes that, that, that are on the property. So it's all those things combined to make it a extremely significant core habitat in this part of Florida, one of the most significant in central, west central Florida. As the name suggests, the green swamp is pretty wet, 
making it a key player in Florida's water conservation efforts. In fact, it was originally established by the U.S. Geological Survey because it was thought the swamp could be engineered to provide flood control. But unlike the Kissimmee River, the green swamp was ultimately left untouched. The, the potentiometric surface of the Florida Aquifer, which is essentially the water level in the Florida Aquifer, it's highest here in the green swamp. So that kind of provides you know, pressure for the, the, the regional pressure for the uh, movement in the green in the Florida aquifer. Um, in, in you know years ago, and like when they did that study, it was initially thought because of that it was the significant recharge area. However, we found over time that it's not the highest. It, this area is not where you get the highest rates of recharge to the Florida. We actually have higher rates of recharge to other areas. But also, what's significant here is it's the headwaters for really four, I mean five uh, rivers, the Withlacoochee River, Hillsboro River, Peace River, the Alkawaha, and the Kissimmee, all derive some portion of their headwaters from the Green Swamp. But water is only one part of the equation here. I guess you look at it in, uh, in, in two terms, really. There's water supply and then there's the habitat. Um, you know, Tampa, uh, the Hillsborough River provides a water supply to the city of Tampa, um, and, you know, in excess of 60 million gallons a day. Um, that's significant, and the headwaters, you know, start up in this area. Um, ha habitat, and that's something that Kevin spoke about, uh, and what you can see right here, I think that's the other very significant thing, um, the habitat that it provides for the wildlife. Rivers and riparian areas uh, are used by many species of wildlife for dispersal, for moving from one patch of habitat to another. Um, and so rivers are wildlife corridors. Uh, and protecting those rivers, you know, protect the wildlife's ability to move from one patch of habitat to another. Uh, you sever that corridor and then you fragmented this network of preserves that's so important to maintaining good viable populations of species in Florida. The landscape within the Green Swamp is as varied as Florida itself. There are wetlands, uplands, sandhills, and scrub. So within the preserve, there are alligators and wading birds, gopher tortoises and deer, and even the occasional scrub jay. It's a place that attracts people looking for the kind of primitive experience this old homestead must have offered. The district sort of features that environment and that experience on the Green Swamp Wilderness Preserve. Uh, where we put as few amenities as, as is possible. You don't see a whole lot of signs and buildings and try to keep the natural, the natural experience as much as we can, but also give people enough information so they can stay on the trails and they know where to go to protect the resources and so on. But uh, it's, a, it's a primitive uh, wild experience that, that people come to the Green Swamp for. But the remote, primitive nature of the preserve could fade with time. Because even though the area is protected, development is creeping in from all sides. And without buffer zones to surround the preserve, the preserve itself could begin to feel the impact. We call it secondary impacts and edge effects. It starts to diminish the, some of the qualities of those conservation lands that purposes for which they were required. For instance, um, you have dense development up against the up against the conservation land, you have light pollution, you have noise pollution, you have a, a, a vector for exotic species to enter the conservation land, both animal and plant. Um, you have uh, you know, an increased predation from house cats, for instance, on, on wildlife species within a preserve. And so what you've done, you've, you've diminished some of the habitat values of that preserve we need as many large core conservation areas as we, as we can get. That's one thing. Uh, just in and of themselves, these large core habitats are important. Uh, the second thing is, and almost just as important, is we need to have some connection between these large core habitats. We need to buffer these cores, but then also we need to connect them so that species can, can disperse from, from patch to patch. There are some tenuous connections. Uh, some connections between, for instance, Ocala and Ocala-Wekaiva is, is a pretty good connection, I think, along the Wekaiva River. 
um, and then the connection with the Kissimmee. Uh, not too bad. The, the green swamp, because of just patterns of development and agricultural, commercial, and residential development. The green swamp's functional connectivity with these other areas that are to the east are, are very tenuous uh, because there are, there are blocks, there are wall barriers uh, in just about every one of those. Now there's a connectivity between the green swamp and areas north like the Withlacoochee State Forest and then eventually um, the Ocala National Forest. There are connect, there's connectivity with the, between the green swamp and for instance the lower Hillsboro River and Upper Hillsboro River uh, to the south and west. Uh, so connectivity is important, important. I think that's something that really needs to be stressed and, and, and really strong emphasis placed on connecting, functionally connecting these, these seven core areas. Someday if we don't consider those options and really take into, into consideration the value of the green swamp and areas like the green swamp and plan accordingly, you know, we could fall into the same trap that we have in other areas. The green swamp is important to our water resources, especially to the Floridan aquifer. But it's also the place where five wonderful Florida rivers are born. The Withlacoochee, Ocklawaha, Hillsboro, Peace, and Kissimmee. All of which have an impact and a beauty that we share with other parts of the state. So protecting this vital resource ought to be important to everyone in Florida. You can experience the green swamp for yourself and enjoy lots of outdoor activities at a number of different parks and preserves. When we come back, some insights into the swamp's history. 8,000 years of it. When we talk about the Green Swamp, we're generally referring to the area mapped out by the Florida and U.S. Geological Surveys in the 60s, the area that today is the Green Swamp Preserve. But archaeologists have found evidence that people were living in and around the Green Swamp as early as 6000 B.C. And when the Spanish conquistadors came along, Hernando de Soto's army passed through an area it called the Green Swamp and later camped in what is now the Withlacoochee State Forest. 500 years later, the descendants of hogs brought over by DeSoto's army are still rooting around in the green swamp. If the swamp is still feeling the impact of a small Spanish army that passed through here 500 years ago, you can only imagine what kind of long-term impact modern development will have. There are a lot of people thinking about that and a number of citizen groups have sprung up to try and help protect the green swamp from urban sprawl. Some of these groups are looking to preserve their rural lifestyles. Others are fighting for the environment. Alicia talked to one Lake County resident about why she's devoted thousands of hours of her time to protecting the green swamp. Matter of fact, as hot as it is, almost everything's in the shade somewhere. Peggy Cox truly seems to have a little corner of the world all to herself. Forty acres at the end of a dirt road fronted by a marsh. She even has an overly shy pet steer named Two Baby. Her place is in the green swamp between the cities of Claremont and Groveland. This is called the transitional area with some limited density and I was attracted because I am a wildlife lover, a great bird watcher, and because I 
I grew up in the country and I wanted to live back in the country again. A member of the Audubon of Florida Board of Directors, Cox is an avid bird watcher. And this piece of property, with its remote location and sprawling marsh, seemed the perfect place for bird watching. I had lived in North Lake County previously on some acreage and on a lake and uh, had lived on the Conway chain of lakes. I love being on the water, but the bird watching here is, is uh, superior. A lot of wading birds, a lot of water birds, songbirds, uh, owls, birds of prey. Um, I forget what my personal bird um, list is for this area. I think it's about 73 species that I've sighted. Here. So yes, it was one of the big draws and the view. You can sit on my front porch and do nothing just looking at the view. You've had some exciting moments out here, for instance, the whooping cranes. Yes, we uh, two winters ago, one of the migratory whooping cranes in the uh, uh, International uh, Crane Foundation's project from Wisconsin to Florida. Uh, spent the winter here after she migrated down. Um, they found her over here by her radio transmitter and they allowed me to track her for about six weeks until she was ready to start her migration back. So it was interesting watching her. She was hanging out with some sandhill cranes. So uh, I enjoyed that a great deal. That experience is one of the reasons Cox has joined the fight against heavy development in the green swamp. I was part of a group that was formed in the beginning of 2004 called the Citizens Coalition of Lake County, which sponsored a citizen initiative for a referendum item on the Groveland City ballot to limit density on any lands that Grove, the city of Groveland annexes into the, in the Green Swamp Area of Critical State Concern to a density of one house per five acres, which is what the county, Lake County, currently has. We, we did that as sort of an action of last resort. We had, uh, and I personally representing Audubon, had opposed some of the Groveland annexations. They've annexed thousands of acres uh, to the north and east, and then they came into the swamp with a 500 acre annexation. And they submitted a change request to the Department of Community Affairs to, to go from one house per five acres to two houses an acre. It's really not appropriate for this area. The land they um, annexed is a high recharge area. It borders these marshes, which are uh, considered um, significant. Um, they feed into the Claremont chain of lakes, the Platlakaha River, which is one of the beginnings of the Ocklawaha River. It's been an exhaustive fight that's involved lawsuits and lots of education outreach. Let's talk about that education effort. When we're out here talking about the green swamp and wanting to preserve it, what's the, the key element here? Is it the aquifer? Is it providing habitat for endangered birds? What's the critical thing out here? Well, the critical thing has to be water. That's what the designation as an area of critical state concern is about. It is about protecting the water, the quality and the quantity of the water that feeds the Florida aquifer. But, and that's what the principles for guiding development that are in Florida Administrative Code speak to on how any development that takes place, even at these rural densities, must happen in this area. But because there's this huge area in South Lake and Polk and South Sumter counties that's basically relatively undeveloped, it is a great wildlife habitat. And it's a critical habitat anymore because, as you know, as we grow from both coasts, we are losing wildlife habitat. We're losing marshes, wetlands are disappearing. So these are becoming more critical, at least in my opinion, because there are, we're losing so many in other places. So we're hoping to uh, raise the importance of the green swamp as an area for wildlife habitat, because we think that's also critical now. But undoubtedly, the water issue is the most critical. Okay, but you're at the end of a dirt road here. Mm -hmm. You have 40 acres, you're, you know, backed up to the marsh mm -hmm. here. Your little corner here is yes, probably sir. gonna remain untouched and you're gonna be able to continue to watch your birds and live in well, peace and quiet. So why go through everything you're going through? Well, because uh, it will change my little corner of the world. When my view includes rooftops on the other side of the marsh, it will diminish the wildlife that can use this. When their habitat is squeezed, they, you tend to lose species because their habitat, there's a, 
and I'm not a biologist, so I don't know the requirements as far as acreage goes or territory, but every species needs a certain area. And so even though my little corner of the world will remain relatively untouched, it will affect my world. And it affects my world when I leave this little piece of paradise because the encroaching sprawl affects our community and it affects my water supply. It affects uh, what my quality of life. So I feel that uh, protecting this area for the water supply, for wildlife habitat, and because I really truly believe we have to change the way we build our communities from these sprawling communities to more dense communities with more countryside and rural areas left rural. Cox says it's not just her quality of life that suffers, it's everyone's. Because we're not equipped to handle the increases in traffic, and our water supply can't handle the increased pressures. And those people who like the outdoors and like spawning wildlife have to go farther and farther out to do that. And she says once people start to recognize that, they too are prompted into action. It's amazing when people uh, are given just a little uh, information on why the green swamp is important or what the effects of sprawl are and for those pe people who live in a rapid growth area whether it be South Lake County or Broward County they see in their communities the effects they see the increased traffic the loss of capacity in their schools um, they know that but when you educate them just a little most people want to have open areas and believe that we should protect wildlife. Most people believe in that. When our Citizens Coalition proposed an amendment to Groveland City Charter to protect the green swamp to keep densities low, it was put on the ballot and 72 percent of the voters approved a charter amendment that said that Groveland on any lands they annexed in the area of critical state concern could not have a density of greater than one house per five acres. Cox says it shows that grassroots battles can be very effective. I think it's effective. It's very time consuming. It's expensive because we ended up having to defend our um, amendment through lawsuits. And as citizens, it's much harder to raise money than uh, business interests and commercial interests and development interests. But we have had probably hundreds of people support us through small donations and a few large ones. I think people understand what's happening to their communities and I think they also understand the importance of keeping viable environmental resources safe and preserved. You see osprey coming up. There are a lot of osprey nests over on the Claremont Chain of Lakes and that's just a mile. Once upon a time, the area around the Green Swamp was just backcountry between Tampa and Orlando. But a recent study done by the University of Pennsylvania has shown us that if we keep dealing with growth the way we have been, eventually we'll have development sprawling from one side of Florida to the other. We need to have all of Florida's citizens involved in the decision about whether we're willing to let that happen. An important part of that will be deciding which places we must fight to save. Should the Green Swamp be one of those? I think so, and I hope you do too. I'm Linda Chapin. Thanks for watching, and we'll hope to see you next time on Naturally Central Florida.